Hi, Anne here with Fully Thriving. I am here with Dr. Clifford and Joyce Penner. They are sex therapists, educators, and authors of 11 books. They're best known for their pioneering work in encouraging people of all faiths to, to connect with their sexuality and their faith, faith system. <laughs> Today, we are gonna talk about how women can enhance their sexuality and learn to enjoy sexual pleasure in marriage. Thank you so much for joining me again. I appreciate it. It's so great to be with you. <laughs> yes, and, and we love talking about wives yes. enjoying the gift of sex. Oh, fantastic. So we're in the right place, and I know our audience is going to want to learn. So this is fantastic. Can we start with like maybe a little bit about the assumptions about women and sex and how they interfere with the sexual relationship in marriage? Probably the most common one we hear is an experience when women share what's going on in their sexual relationship is that they feel like the man needs sex and it's their duty to fill that need rather than that they get with sex and enjoy it. And when we do sex out of duty or demand, it really takes away the joy and pleasure God designed us to be able to enjoy. Absolutely. And so that duty factor is a big one. Yeah, and, and it's interesting. We hear this in so many different ways from, from different people like, well, if I don't, maybe it's because God said I should or the Apostle Paul said I should. Uh, but then it's also, if I don't, then he's going to be in a bad mood or um, it's going to cause trouble between us. So if it's been three days or a week, now I've, I've got to do my duty, which it, um, really doesn't bring pleasure to the man either. Yes, there may be some sexual satisfaction, but when she's doing it out of duty, it doesn't feel good to him either. Ultimately, it really isn't what he wants. He may feel those needs and put on the pressure, but it doesn't satisfy. And then there's kind of the feeling for many women that to be sexy as a woman is a bad thing it's okay. shameful it's wrong it's like the term that's often used i don't want to be seen as a slut so i'm not i'm not i can't express my sexual intensity and i think that often starts in what we teach kids and adult girls especially in adolescence about dating and mm -hmm. keeping themselves pure and it's like if you're sexy then he can't control himself and it's like the guy doesn't have a responsibility to take care of, take control of his actions. It's her that has a responsibility. And so we diminish that sexuality as good for the woman, even as it is for the man. So that's a second assumption. A third one would be that is a belief that men need sex and, and that they've got to have it. And it's the wife's duty back to the duty thing to fulfill that need and that need sex based on need really isn't what it's about it's about our giving ourselves to each other and sharing and enjoying and delighting each other and then there's also the thing that we as women often have is that if he loved me he would really know what i need oh, so yeah. rather than taking responsibility to let him know what we need and invite and encourage, we just feel bad and hurt and alone and sad when he doesn't do what we need. Because right. if he loved me, he would know. Well, men don't automatically know. And sometimes we even tell them and they don't remember. So, We've always kiddingly said that as a man gets more aroused, he loses more and more of his memory. <laughs> And so to guide and let him know what we need, not demanding, not complaining, yeah. but rather inviting and going after. And we're not by that saying that the man isn't responsible for what he does. So I, I wasn't no. excusing the man, but yeah. it is, there's a little truth to that. Uh, that, that we just think love is uh, shown when he automatically knows what we need. Yes, that makes sense. Well, and even when you talked about the man losing some of his brain cells, that's, we yeah. <laughs> chuckle at that. 
And wouldn't that be true if a woman is fully present and involved as well, that she would lose some of her brain cells in the midst of things too? Yes, I think so. We do. <laughs> we, we get into the moment, we lose ourselves, and that is part of the joy and delight of giving and receiving in the sexual experience. Yeah, wonderful. Connected with this is, is the idea that is important to, for women to really get, and that is that there is nothing that turns on a man more than a turned on woman. So the greatest, the, the, the thing women often think about is that they've got to please the man somehow. Well, the most pleasing thing they can do is to get with themselves. And they say, isn't that selfish? It is, but it works. And it is actually a lot better for both of them when she gets with herself and her own sexuality and shares it with him. Yes. Mm, that's wonderful. Yeah, that's so true. So um, in your experience, what helps women overcome barriers and get to that place of full acceptance and expression? Well, one of the surprising things about that has been that, that education, learning about sex is one of the key things that we find makes a difference. Which surprised us early on when we began teaching in the 70s, mid-70s, we've been at this a long time, we thought the clinical process was absolutely necessary. That is the counseling process. But right. we have found that a piece of data information, it's like, oh, really? And it can change when women find new information and new, especially uh, connecting it with good and of God. And we always say that if we were all raised healthy sexually yeah. by age 13, we would have learned that sex is good and of God. Mm -hmm. And when women didn't learn that, for example, if a woman was caught self-stimulating or exploring mm -hmm. and was punished or shamed, then she doesn't have the feelings that sex is good and of God. And she may need to do a lot of reading in scripture or Christian-based sex books like ours, The Gift of Sex, or whatever works for or her. Or for the woman, the book Enjoy, The Gift of Sexual Pleasure for Women, would yeah. be most connecting here. Yeah. But then also that we hope by age 13 they know that sexual curiosity is natural. That is, it is, it is totally normal to be curious and interested about sex. We and have, we have a five-year-old granddaughter who is already asking some of those early questions. It's a curious thing. And yet we find that the whole issue of pornography is a real issue in today's world because it will come up on our phones. And we particularly struggle with that because our our uh, website is passionatecommitment.com and so we get sexual questions and because of that we can't put on some of the blocks and controls right. and so then we get pictures on our phones and when kids see those for example one of the issues we deal with with women frequently just dealing with it this week is a woman had her first orgasm when she just happened upon uh, pornography as, just, a, as a kid yeah as a actually young adult late teenage years and had her first orgasm and now what happens is and this is typical we find this that she can't be orgasmic with her husband mm -hmm. unless she pictures that those women she's not attracted to women it's just what we find is sexual responses are easily conditioned and self-perpetuating. Just we want to say that again, sexual responses are easily conditioned and self-perpetuating. And so if our first response is to an extra, extra, external. external stimulus and we are curious and we watch and we go after it and then have that response, which is so natural, then it can get in the way. But knowing that that curiosity is good and natural and then that sexual responses are innate. That and is what we mean by that is that all of us will experience sexual arousal. That is a given thing, the way our bodies are designed. It's going to happen. And when we teach kids, again, that to, to have those feelings and desires is good, but the next 
principle, we want them to know that sexual responsibility belongs to each of us. So what we're saying there is all of us are sexually responsive, but all of us are also responsible for what we do with those feelings. So we we need to teach kids it's not wrong to desire sex and to or desire. To, or even to get aroused because that's going to happen. Right. But we can make choices. We're not innocent by reason of arousal. We have the responsibility and can make choices. Yeah. I really appreciate you clarifying that because I think we have um, probably a cultural history for girls, especially within the Christian faith of, you know, that it's bad and, and um, you know, the purity. I love what you said about uh, the teen girls feeling like they're responsible for the, the young man's purity. Right. Um, instead of just being responsible for themselves. Both right? of us are responsible. Yeah. Right. Yeah. And, right. So, and I've, I've heard that because I've, I've worked with youth over the years and I've heard that this concept of somehow they're bad because somebody else is attracted to them. And, right. then, and then the touching upon the topic of pornography and how that impacts women, because I think we talk a lot about how that impacts men. Um, right. But it's becoming, you know, the, the scales are balancing and it's becoming more women than ever have experience with viewing pornography and how it's impacted their sex life. So right and yeah. it makes sense that when kids get when that comes up whether they walk into a hotel room and it happens to be on the tv screen or they are on a computer or they're at a friend's house and the parents left something around whatever it is it's innocent Mm -hmm. And it's natural to be curious. And that's what they have to realize. Their curiosity about that wasn't something wrong. It's just that then if that caused stimulation and caused this response, they can get hooked on that and have to recondition that. So the first thing, there's an answer to your question. Education. Well, your, your question was mm -hmm. about how women can overcome barriers. And the first thing we're talking about is education. Uh, okay. The second thing we would talk about there is is bringing up the whole issue of what is it, what are characteristics of women who really do enjoy their sexual experience? And that is to have realistic expectations. Mm -hmm. So many times we think <clears throat> that the way it was before marriage will be the way it is after marriage. And we're talking there about the excitement level, whether there was intercourse before marriage or not. Sure. Uh, just that initial, the power of that initial attraction. Right. And then that we have to shift, and we talked about that last time, to the attachment to the long term. Right. And that it will be different after we have babies. And that it will be different as we age. And it will be different that we want to make it as good as it can be, given the reality of our situation. Yeah. And clarifying that is very helpful. So education, realistic expectations and uh, then making sure that we connect our sexuality with our spirituality if that's there so we don't separate good and god from sex yes yeah and one thing we often find helpful for women to do is to pay a little bit of attention to what messages they got from their mother about sex or even when, in their home generally yeah and and mother may have never even talked about it but kids always pick up the feeling whether right. it's words or actions and mm -hmm. and most of the time unless we are deliberate about it we tend to follow what our parents did and yeah. as a woman what we saw and who was our role model and i had a neat experience of growing up in a tiny little town of 600 in a church of 65 where my Sunday school teacher was the same from the time I was six till I was 16 oh and she God. she when we wrote our first book she wrote me a little note saying how important this was in her life mm -hmm. and how sad it was that we didn't talk about it in the church mm -hmm. and I realized that she was my role model and taught me, even though the word was never mentioned, mm -hmm. feeling good about myself as a woman mm -hmm. and feeling confident and competent. And I would have never known that the sexual relationship in her marriage had been important if we hadn't written the book and she had written that to me. Yeah, wow. What a now, one of the things that we want to help women do then is to help them learn to, to listen to what's going on in their body. What we mean by that is that 
we believe that just like men, women were created as sexual beings and that there are sexual feelings and responses going on. But a lot of times women have not learned to listen to that. And so I think we need to talk about that and, a minute. And so many times women who may feel that God just left that part out um, and didn't you know, give them that. On the, on the assembly line, when, when they put that person together, she missed that chip. And are actually angry with us for talking the way we're talking now because they have never had a good sexual feeling. But when we deal with them and explore that, there's hurt there. And we always talk about, even as God designed mankind to long to have relationship with him and desire him, God designed us with sexual desire and responses. But even as sin in the world may have blocked our desire for God or an awareness of a need for God, our there are things in the world or in our bodies that may have happened, whether that's physical, hormonal, emotional, spiritual training, training that block that desire. So we may not know what to listen to. And so becoming aware of just even little tinglings, any tiny thing and affirming it and thanking God for it. Yeah, and because so many times w women have practiced shutting down on those feelings rather than encouraging those feelings. And so that, that we think is, is very important in terms of helping women overcome some of those barriers. And then learning to communicate openly. And I, you mentioned this last time and we'll mention again, but reading a book out loud together is very helpful. When we don't have the natural tools or tendency to be able to talk openly about sex. So because when we read it out loud to each other, we can interact then with the content we're reading and it gives us the tools and the opportunities to open up. Yeah, and the words sometimes. And the words, yes. Yeah. And then to give her permission to enjoy pleasure and listen to her body and not worry so much about her responses, but just the enjoyment. And let's just say a word about that. There are some people who resist the idea of enjoying sexual pleasure as if somehow that's, that's bad, that's that's slutty again, uh, especially for a woman. We expect that men will enjoy the sexual pleasure, but the woman isn't supposed to. And yet, if we read the Song of Solomon, it's all about sexual pleasure, uh, yes. the whole book. And uh, so that, that's pretty vital for us to be willing to accept the idea of sexual pleasure. Right, and we've talked a little bit about like preconceptions um, about you know, how a woman looks and views sex and the sexual relationship and how that can interfere with her expression and her satisfaction. What are some other things that might interfere? There are, we always say that uh, it's important to heal from anything that might interfere. And there may be heal, we might need to heal from past hurts, like if there was sexual abuse in the past. Mm -hmm. And that may or may not be remembered, but the person may have symptoms of that. And the way we identify it is there's usually high interest before and outside of marriage. And then it shuts down within marriage because now she feels trapped like she did in the abuse. And then if she was raised in an alcoholic. Yeah, let me just say a word about that. A, a woman raised in an alcoholic home or an out of control home. It could also be where somebody was mentally ill or somebody was a rageaholic or, or yeah. violent or whatever. Anything like that will, can get in the way of uh, being free because they learned early that they had to be in control because the parents around them weren't in control. And in sex, we lose control. So that being out of control is scary, it's frightening. And they, even when they have a good experience, they shut down right after and don't want to do that again. And then a very common one are conditioned fantasies. And that's what we talked about when we mentioned uh, Just a sexual few, min few minutes ago. Curiosity. And if we attached our sexual arousal response orgasm to some external stimulation and then have need that fantasy of seeing women being sexual 
in order to respond. And then we have to recondition that when women are hooked on that. But then there are also current hurts, it, relational. If, if there has been a lot of pain and tension in the marriage between the husband and wife, um, resentments, demands. The, the, the woman may back off from the intimacy of the relationship because of the wounds that she carries. And those need to get dealt with uh, yeah. between them so that she can in, again engage. And that is a difference between men and women. Men, men seem to be able to be, have a fight and have great sex afterwards. And women need to feel safe and comfort. And, you know, men sometimes feel close once they do have sex, whereas women need to feel close before they have sex. And then there's the current hurts is physical pain. And we mentioned that, and we just always like to mention that because sex is meant to feel good. And if it hurts, we're not gonna have satisfaction. So that, and that is correctable. Pelvic floor physical therapy is the best way to deal with that. And then there are continuous hurdles that we deal with, lack of desire. Sometimes we don't know why. Difficulty with getting aroused, inability to let go. By that we mean inability to have an orgasm, um, and and the idea that that some women don't need orgasms is, in our view, a false idea. It 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 does not fit with reality, because the sexual experience is about for both men and women about the buildup of bodily tension, and then the release of that tension. We often compare it to a sneeze, and. That, mm -hmm. that, that an orgasm is really just a pelvic sneeze. And there's true. the buildup of that tension, and then there's the release of that tension. And it is what happens in the body, because with the sneeze, our, our vessels fill with blood and fluid, they get engorged, and that we, triggers the sneeze reflex, and the same thing happens genitally. There's an engorgement, and then it triggers the orgasmic reflex. And just like there are some people, when they sneeze, the whole you know, the chandelier shakes. The kids cry. Yeah. <laughs> and then other people sneeze, you know, <clears throat> and you hardly know it was a sneeze. Just like that, there are a lot of differences from one orgasm to another for a woman. Yeah. But but um, a woman does need orgasm if she's going to enjoy sex for a lifetime. Yes, yes. And, and as you're talking about all these things that can kind of come in the way, I'm thinking, what about that poor woman who maybe had a, a turbulent home, was sexually abused as a child, and now they're married and she's experiencing physical pain. What would you say to her? Like, where wow, are you yes, they, she's got she, she's three got, of them. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> because that's it's that not, is not very uncommon. Good stuff, I think, yeah. yeah. So where yeah. would you start? We would you start with the physical pain because, and sometimes we deal with all of it, but at the same time. But if, and that isn't actually promoting us because we would promote the pelvic floor physical therapist in that case. Because if the physical is there, it's harder to deal with the emotional relational. If the physical pain is there, yeah. right. no one wants to engage in a pleasurable activity that hurts because then it's not pleasurable. <laughs> yeah. Somehow don't like to go to the dentist <laughs> when it hurts. It's going to hurt. <laughs> it isn't what we choose. And I think Sometimes the husband, I was just dealing with somebody this past week, and the husband said he realized, you know, hadn't really thought about that. Mm -hmm. And he was just frustrated with her not wanting it when oh, yeah. the pain was there. And it really helped him to hear me talk about if the pain isn't there, is there, they should not be having intercourse because pain triggers more pain. And the tighter she gets, the more they try. And so back up and do everything else you can do without having the sex. And the, then, the, the, whatever it is that triggers the pain. Right. right. And then work on the trauma and the emotional out of control home. So what we mean by that is that almost all people who have that kind of stuff in their past are going to need some outside help. A counselor of some type that can help them work through that pain of the past. Well, and with the, the uh, being raised in an out of control home, usually this person has a not high need for control in many areas. Sure. And so helping her 
use her need for control to work for her rather than against her. We're pretty practical on those kind of things. Rather than fighting and fighting that need for control, there's some benefits to needing to be in control. So one of the ways yeah. we talk about it then is, look, if you decide that, that, that it would be good to have sex once a week, I'll just use that as an example, then you as the woman who have the need for control, see to it that it happens. Rather than resisting, right. make the decision. All of us would like to have sex out of hunger and desire, but for this person, that's not going to be the case. It's going to be because she decided to, and then as she gets into the experience, she is most likely to experience it positively, but she won't go into it positively until she makes the action to choose it. And then realizing if she does have an intense orgasm and knows how to be out of control, she might have that feeling afterwards of not wanting that again, but really talking about that with her husband and saying, I know it's good for me. I know it's good for us. Uh, I want to keep doing this even though it feels scary and let him hold her and mm -hmm. affirm her and feel safe with him. Keep her eyes open. Keep connected. Yeah. So the simple solution to your your trifecta there uh, deal, well, with the deal, deal with the pain deal with the trauma and then make decisions about being together sexually rather about than the control issue rather than having it come out of desire which it's not going to happen for that woman right. for a while right right i like for a while because we can when we make a choice to take our thoughts captive we're training our brain to think a certain way and eventually the, the feelings yes. catch up, right? Yes, exactly. Yes. And especially when we affirm those feelings and the keeping the eyes open and connected eye, eye to eye contact during sex with her husband will help both in terms of the sexual trauma in the past and the control. So we would say, keep the lights on and keep your eyes open so that you have eye to eye contact so that it doesn't take you back into that past stuff. And if you can't do that all at first, start gradually, like dim lights at first, or okay. barely lights on, and peek at the eyes, you know, keep it, yeah, yeah. there you go. <laughs> that's good. Uh, yeah. Well, that's, that, that's really wise advice. And I, you mentioned the part about how fear impacts a woman's sexuality and i'm just thinking in marriages because it is it's the whole package right sex is not right. mentalized and um, i mean and in to some degree and correct me if i'm wrong uh even for the man i mean there's there's they're able to compartmentalize it in the sense of doing the act but when it comes to the relationship if it's only compartmentalized it's it's not creating the same emotional intimacy that it would otherwise am i correct in that uh, exact absolutely mm -hmm. yeah okay. So if a woman is experiencing fear, it's going to impede her ability to enjoy sex, which will impede the emotional relationship because even if she's doing it anyway, right? Right. So she's got to deal with that fear, whatever that Absolutely. fear is, whether it's around sex or whether it's around, well, hey, right now we've got people yeah. who lost their jobs, right? Maybe yeah. you're just terrified for your financial future. Somehow yeah. coming to a place of resolving that will help improve the sex life. Yes, definitely. Our stressors are not just, uh, our barriers are not just sexual ones. Yeah. External barriers really get in the way. And especially for women, because we function on two tracks, the emotional and the sexual, and those two have to be connected. Whereas men, when they're physically aroused, usually their emotions are right there with them. We, now, we, we, always, we kid that about men having a one-track mind, well, there, it, it's overstating it a bit, but there's some truth to it, that when a man gets aroused, that's all he's thinking about, whereas when a woman gets aroused, she may also be thinking about how she's going to get ready for work tomorrow morning, or that the dishes still need to be done, or that there's a drip in the shower, you know? Yeah, yeah. and I, women, that's another thing that women often will ask about, during sex, I have all these other things I talk about or think about. And we say that's natural. Just, you know, if you can just, again, keep your eyes connected, go back. But don't beat yourself up if those thoughts come to you in your mind during sex. It doesn't mean you're not present. It's just how our brains work differently. 
Yeah, yeah, that makes sense. So in some way, you could say that if um, you've got a lot on your plate and uh -huh. you know you want to spend some time with your husband and be intimate, uh -huh. um, that you might actually say, honey, can we take an hour and knock out some of the chores together? Because that will really turn me on. <laughs> yes, de definitely, definitely. Would, Absolutely. Would, would most husbands respond to that, you think? Oh, yeah, I well, think a lot will. As, as long as, as, long as uh, they end up with what she promised. <laughs> <laughs> if, if she's tired when she's done with the dishes, I'm, oh, sorry, after a I while. I thought I would feel like it, but now I don't. And that may happen sometimes, oh, but it can't happen all the that time. That can't be the pattern. <laughs> sometimes, I know for me, even making the list with him helps me. Well, that's a good I don't point. even have to do the task. If we make the list and decide who's going to do what, that helps get it off my brain. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so and maybe for those controlling types, scheduling it in the morning so you have all day to get to your to-do list and you won't have to. That's there for you sure. go. There you go. Yeah. Yeah. Were you gonna say something? Oh, I was just going to go on to our our, our next possible topic of yeah. of um, we, we, we mentioned the book Enjoy the Gift of Sexual Pleasure for Women and where we deal with all the stuff we're talking about today. Yeah. So. And, and in there, what we're trying to do is, is help the woman embrace her sexuality as a good and positive thing about her, and that that is the most important thing she can do in her marriage sexually. Yes, encourage her to, and really we promote effective, healthy, sexual, scriptural attitudes. Mm -hmm. about women that enhance sexual satisfaction for both and that's really the goal of the book yeah, that's and, and that's one that that often is good for a couple to read out loud together um because it, it'll it'll help both of them understand each other and one thing we really do find helps if we both the husband and the wife understand that women are much more complex and less predictable than men sexually. We change with our hormonal changes during a month, during a week, during life, during yeah. lifespan. And all of that complexity and intensity can be a really wonderful thing for the sex life when it's fueled properly and directed properly. But it also has to be cared for and understood if it's frustrating us <clears throat> as women, if it's frustrating our husbands, then it can get in the way rather than realizing that complexity is there for a reason and it can work for us rather than against we us. We often kiddingly say that, that the woman was created second and mm -hmm. she's kind of the new improved model with a <laughs> lot of extras, you know. It's not a, <laughs> not, a sim, not a simple stick shift Chevy, you know. Uh, there's, a, there's a lot of stuff there. But that's what keeps it interesting for a lifetime. Yeah. Because you never get it down. Right. It, it's ever changing. It's ever growing. It's, it's evolving all the time. And because of that, again, it's so important to have a realistic expectations. Back to what women who enjoy sex. Right. They have realistic expectations because things do change over time and in different situations. If we've got preschoolers, we're going to be tired. We're not going to have as much energy. And we have to figure out ways to work with that. Um, and if we have illnesses or things later in life, as we age, we'll have to adapt to that. So having realistic expectations is so important. And then another thing we deal with so much in the book Enjoy, the title, is focusing on enjoyment, not the results. Because when we get in our head, and this is something we deal with a lot with women, and start watching our responses and monitoring. Let's see, am I getting as roused as I did last time? Oh, I wonder, you know, am I going to have an orgasm this time? I wonder if it's going to hurt if we've had pain and we start watching and getting tense. And if we can just, usually when those things come in our head, and if women are listening and they're, they're one of those that's up there watching <laughs> when they're in a sexual experience, two things help. One is verbalizing. And when we sit, let our husband know, 
I, you know, I'm in my head again, or whatever we, we can just even have a word that says it so it doesn't interrupt. Verbalizing, it shifts from our right hemisphere of our brain to the left. Okay. The left is our verbal center. The right has more control over our body when it's spinning around in there. Okay. And when we verbalize it, it gets it out of there and then distract, focus, change the focus to something else rather than thinking about, am I going to get aroused? Listening to my body and what's feeling good? What would really, what's touch? What and do not, I enjoy and, and about And not me? only am I getting aroused, but am I getting aroused fast enough? Yeah, a, all those am, things. am I pleasing him? Uh, is is he going to get bored? Does this take too long? Last time he said it took too long. Yeah, I mean, it goes on and on. All those things that can go on in a, in a woman's head. And learning to acknowledge those, talking about it at a time when you're not in a sexual experience so that he, does, you know, where is this coming from? <laughs> so you can tell him, you know, when I go in there, my head, I'm going to let you know by saying this. And then I'm going to try to switch and really think about what feels good and go after it with you and listen to my body and enjoy the good feelings. And maybe I'll ask you to, you know, rub my feet or my inner thighs or something that's a little bit farther away from the hot spots uh, to get me relaxed and just enjoy. Or maybe we need to just kiss passionately for a while uh, just to let go of those thoughts. Yeah. So I love what you said there about the when you speak it out loud. That's so good because yeah, it makes perfect sense that then your brain would be able to release it. Transition. Yeah, and and this would be true for a man too. I know we're talking about women, but just a thing for yeah, the men. Yeah. If men get anxious about their performance, it is also help for them, helpful for them to express that out loud. And then distract from it by focusing on her body. Uh, and so it's the same kind of yeah. thing on right. both sides there. Mm -hmm. yeah. The other thing that we really want to help couples get a hold of is, is uh, understanding their differences and having those, make those work for them rather than that they have to get in the way. Yeah. For example, we know very well that women, as we said earlier, need to connect emotionally and intimately before they are free to open up sexually. Mm -hmm. And if, if men understand that, um, they're not going to resist that idea, mm -hmm. uh, but rather get with it and, and let that difference work for them. But, but often, um, either women don't express that or the man may be resistant to it. And, uh, and yet that's what ultimately will lead from the emotional openness to the physical openness. And then just realize in our world today, there are a lot of outside distractions from intimacy, connection, sex, and protecting our marriages from those distractions. Not that they won't be there, but how do we carve out time for ourselves? How do we get some protective space yeah. Yeah. and allow time to be together? Not that we have to be turned on during that time, but that we provide for that so we have those opportunities. And that's not always easy. I mean, particularly in this world, if you have, uh, we know our children now have their children at home full time when they were going to school during the day or away at college during the day, yeah. I mean, during the whole year, yeah. and now they're home, all of them, and doing everything from home. Well, life is totally how do you find any privacy during that time during COVID? And so what, what the underlying principle here is that if we're going to have a fulfilling sex life, we have to be intentional about it rather than counting on it happening just spontaneously. And particularly with a drastic change like this from having children gone part of the day or all of the day and now being at home. But, but even apart from that, even if yeah, just a couple is home, we, yeah. we have to make active choices about it and be intentional rather than then uh, spontaneity is great but often people who are committed to spontaneity have very little sexual experience right and then it, one thing we didn't mention when we were talking about protecting but that also we talk about in the book enjoy is when we talk about making 
the sexual experience the best it can be given your reality. We think about if zero is neutral, it's not bad, it's not negative, but it's also not wonderfully ecstatic. You don't want it to go below zero. As long as it's zero or even a low level, you know, pleasure plus 0.5, it's okay. You don't want to engage in things that are negative, but it's okay. It doesn't have to be a 10. Most of the time in life, sex won't be 10s. When those may happen early in the experience or on vacation or in some special moment. On your anniversary night or something. Maybe. That may be more tense than ever. Yeah. But, <laughs> but just making sure that we don't engage in sexual practices that are painful, that are negative, that aren't mutually satisfying or at least neutral. Right. No, that's so true. Um, the whole, even mentally, if there's a lot of conflict happening yeah. and you feel like you should, because maybe it's been a while, if going back to that should, that can yes. actually impede your sexual pleasure for the long haul yeah. by you kind of yes. falling into that. Yeah. Yes. Now, go ahead. No, I was waiting. Oh, okay. Um, I, I just think it's it's very important for us to get this message across, and that is, we believe every couple can find a fulfilling sexual life together if they're willing to work on it. Some people will come with the attitude that, that we just weren't lucky in that department or something like that. Uh, mm -hmm. We don't find that to be the case when people are willing to diligently focus on it and deal with it. And, that, and have realistic expectations. Right. Right. That's... You know, if we expect it's going to be like in the movies or wherever, we have this false view of married sex or we learn from pornography, uh, then it, that won't, we won't label that or experience that as fulfilling. Yeah. So when we say fulfilling, again, we like to use this zero to plus 10 or zero to minus 10 uh, and not realize we don't want it to be negative for either. And that's why we talk about the main scriptural concept we hear in terms of sex and marriage is mutuality. Yeah. It has to be as good for one as it is for the other if it's going to be good for both for a lifetime. Yes, so. yeah, yes. And, you know, you mentioned the pornography again, and I'm wondering if we can just talk for a second. If a woman has gotten herself caught up in that and it's impeding her married sex life, what are her best next steps? Well, first of all, to get help, to get control if she's still engaged in it. If it's just the fantasy she's stuck with, like the one I talked about where a young girl or teenager or even young adult has her first orgasm from the external stimulus. But she's not into pornography at all now, but just going with it's fantasy, just that that's one thing. Response. But if it's somebody who, who is struggling with pornography uh, currently, what we would strongly recommend is probably three things. One, it would be helpful to deal with some kind of a helpful counselor to get that out loud. Yeah. Two, they, they need to join some kind of a group that is dealing with this. And, and depends on where people are in the, in the country and what's available, but whether it's Celebrate Recovery or, or who, whoever knows what the name of the organization is, yeah. Where, where addictions are able to be dealt with. And then thirdly, in all likelihood, just like with AA, they probably need a sponsor that they can contact every day. Mm. And we rarely find people getting control of it unless they do at least two of those three things, at least a group and a sponsor, and hopefully a, a helping counselor that can help them deal with it. And there are places... Uh, recovery places for that where people can go um, there are yeah there are more intense places if it's a really major struggle right. and they can't get control of it they can go for a week or 30 days or whatever mm -hmm. uh, okay. but but we would always encourage starting with a group and a sponsor okay. as the beginning point and and we think that's that sound 
biblically too, in terms of getting someone else to help us. And then really story. help build intimacy with their spouse, not just sex, because mm -hmm. pornography is non-intimate. Mm -hmm. When we become attached to the non-intimate sexual, we have to learn intimacy. And last time we talked about our formula for intimacy. And yeah. that's, we'll review that again. That's so important. Yeah. And that daily eye-to-eye -eye contact sharing because we, that eye-to-eye -eye contact triggers oxytocin, the bonding hormone. Mm -hmm. And then if we're, wherever we are spiritually connecting together with God, whether that's through prayer or devotional or whatever, mm -hmm. and then a 20 second full body front to front hug at least once a day. Yeah. And which produces, days, which produces oxytocin. The bonding. Yeah. And reduces fear. Yeah. Yes. Yes. <laughs> and then five to 30 seconds of passionate kissing. That is not an indication you want sex just for the right. sake of kissing. There, that's an end in itself. Right. Mm -hmm. And uh, that kind of daily... That counteracts that non-intimate pornography. But so yeah. it is, the, we always talk about it in two, two sections. One is getting control of the addiction, but then also uh, developing the capacity for intimacy so that it, you really go heart to heart with uh, your husband uh, in that process. Yeah. Yeah, we will include a link to that here for our audience to be able to access that. I know the last event we ran, I had people emailing me, telling me how much those 15 minutes were transforming their marriage. Great. Great. Yeah, yeah you, you know, and, and we hear that all the time yes. our, also, that, okay. that we, we'll say, if you do, you know, we'll do a 10-hour seminar, mm -hmm. but we say, if you make mm -hmm. no other change than just have that 15 minutes, we can guarantee it will change your relationship. And many counselors just order that little card or print it out themselves. We don't care what you do to get <laughs> it uh, and have give it to their clients because they find it makes such a difference. So it's really a helpful tool. And all these are just tools, you know, they're just ways that we have found make it a difference. So um, I know we're getting close to running out of time here, but I was just going to say it is so important for, for couples to, to keep the topic open between each other and keep talking about it. And, and because so many are uncomfortable talking about it, they may just avoid it. But we don't find that sexual issues fix themselves over time. The only way they get fixed is if we're willing to be with it, learn, read, communicate, share, uh, and all that. Right. Well, and generally, relationship issues don't fix themselves, right? Exactly. No, no. Yeah, this is no different than all the rest right. of the relationship it's, issues. It's sad, but they're self-perpetuating, unfortunately. Yes. yes, because our default just doesn't, it doesn't work that way. But, yeah. you yeah. know, I love what you said about education as well, because, you know, if you're having a hard time finding those words, grab one of Clifford and Joyce's books and sit and read them together. I know that, you know, with my clients, when we do education around communication yeah. and intimacy and conflict, I mean, they're like, oh, wait a minute, I never knew that because we're not taught these things. Mom and dad exactly. sit down and say, let me teach you how to be a good husband. Let me teach you how to be a good wife. Yeah. Instead, we learn from, you know, watching them, but oftentimes unresolved issues were there that we were watching, so. Well, and many times, when we decide we don't want to be like our parents, we still fall. That's our default. Unless we are really intentional, we'll fall into those same patterns. Really? If our parents were the model we liked and like, we'd like to have, we have it easy. Yeah. It's, we say that as parenting and in our relationship. Then it makes it easy because it's just natural for us. Mm -hmm. so. Absolutely. Well, thank you so much for your time and your generosity. I really appreciate it. As always, you delivered plenty of wisdom here. Good, yeah. good. Well, we just had one tip we wanted to leave for your guests. Oh, the yes, best please. gift women can give themselves, their husband, and honor God in their marriage is to get with their sexuality and share it with him. Affirm anything sexual. Thank God for any little tingle sensations and communicate sexual urges rather than demand, complain, invite, and share. And that's what we'd like to leave you with. Yes, wonderful. Thank you for those wise words. Thanks for having us. Yes, we enjoy, enjoy this. It. It's fun. Yeah.
Likewise. Blessings to everyone who's listening.